FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's December 20th, 2017. 11 more days left till tax reform kicks in. Hey, as always, email us, kl at kerrylutz.com, kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz. We answer all, be part of the show. So tax reform's kicking in. For some, it's a mixed bag. For others, it's a major score. And for still others, it's, eh, well, which is it going to be? Well, Jordan Goodman's with us now. And to opine on it, Jordan, welcome back. Great to be with you again, Kerry. It is a mixed bag, and, and there's going to be big winners and big losers based on this tax reform, and it's intentional. I mean, they really are trying to stick it to the high-tax states with big property taxes, and they're going to get it. So New York, New Jersey, California, uh, Connect- Michigan, pl- you know, places with big taxes are going to get hit. Minnesota Minnesota has a 9.85% state tax rate on the highest earners. Uh, you've got many states. Actually, a state like Illinois is not as bad as a state like New York, where it goes up to like nine percent on the if you're making over a million and then if you're in new york city god forbid you get another five and a half percent tacked on to there but look yeah sure congress wanted to stick it to the uh, blue state people but the other thing is why if i live in florida and i don't have a state income tax why should i subsidize your state income tax high state just because you have tax. just because you have been for many years there's no yeah. reason for it but it's just been the custom and people have made economic decisions based on the existing tax code which is you get a deduction for state income taxes and for property taxes as much as they are that's now going to be limited mm-hmm. to $10,000 the two combined property tax and state income tax maximum right. 10,000 uh, which is going to mean that people are going to pay a lot more in taxes because they're going to lose both those deductions and i think on the margin some people will move from high tax states like New York, California, to low tax states like Florida and California and, and the Texas, uh, because uh, some people just don't want to pay those taxes. I mean, the idea of the overall picture was you had to raise taxes from something to cut taxes on other places, like the mm. corporate rate going down and like the pass through, which is a big tax cut for uh, LLCs and subchapter S corporations that are now going to have a much lower rate than they did before paying at personal income rates. So somebody's got to pay for somebody else getting big benefits. There. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, I don't know how many people are really going to move, but I think a lot of you out there, it pays to become a renter. And let me give you for instance here on a house that's worth $120,000 in no special place in Florida. And that's a low priced home, middle class, working class. Generally, your rent is going to be somewhere around 1% of the value of that home per month. In other words, $1,200. However, if you're renting a six or $700,000 home, your rental is going to be somewhere around half a percent per month. So on higher end homes, you pay, you actually get a discount off of value of that home. Now we might very well see that trend reverse here, Jordan, and those higher end homes could go up in value or be more sought after as rental properties than they are currently. I agree with you because I think a lot of people are not going to want to own their own homes or at least on the margin. I think people will make a decision uh, if there's a place with high property taxes, um, never mind state income taxes. If only $10,000 is deductible, uh, maybe it's going to make more sense to run that as a business and and rent it out. I I agree with you. It's going to change the real estate market in a major, major way. You've already seen that. Mortgage applications recently were down about 5% because people are unsure going into this whether they want to buy a home or not. So this is a major change change in kind of the American dream. Everybody wants to own a home. I think a lot fewer people will do so, and particularly in the high-tax states, fewer people. It's going to really reduce the, the values of homes in uh, high-tax states, and particularly where the property taxes are, are higher and the, the values of the homes are higher. Yes. Yeah, but for Joe Sixpack, making up to like 100000 a year, tax the tax uh, bill is a net positive. Usually, uh, the standard deduction is doubling from 12000 to 24000 for a family. Uh, 85 to 90% of Americans will no longer need to itemize at all, uh, which is a good thing. It means it simplifies things. Uh, it also means that they don't care anymore about mortgage deductions 
charitable contributions, medical expenses, student loan interests, all kinds of things they've been worried about in the past that uh, well, they will not have to think about in the pa- in the future, uh, which in some ways is a good thing. I mean, it's basically the tax code should be kind of somewhat neutral and not trying to do social engineering. Um, so that's going to be a big change for a lot of people. And, and those people who are worried about, for example, charities are worried that people will not contribute as much if they don't get a tax deduction. So it's going to change behavior all over the place. Oh, yeah unintended consequences and like you're i don't know if they excluded law firms and accountants from the pass-throughs i think they did i think that because that's going to be a big game is what is a pass-through uh a subchapter s llc you can't like be an athlete uh you know and then create your own you know jim jones uh llc is right things like that but this is what they call the guardrails but Mm -hmm. there's a lot of very smart accountants well uh, who are going to try to figure out how to get around these things and create llc's and subject oh, yeah. all over the place well the obvious thing is if you have a law firm the law firm itself won't be a pass-through but you can create a practice management corporation to run that which a lot of uh, medical practices already use and i think the practice management company isn't going to be excluded from the uh from those guardrails i think that's it'll right be within the guardrails so that's every right. big law firm going to have a practice management, big medical practices, they often already do. That's what enables them to go across state lines and build up the uh, the practice by acquiring other practices. But now it'll be de rigor. You know, you'll, you'll just set it up automatically. And, uh, but I think if you make less than 315, I, I don't, jointly, 315,000, I think the limitations don't apply. Do I have that right? That's right. That's right. So, so it's going to be a big game. I mean, well, in theory, the the purpose of this is to get small businesses growing, paying lower taxes, hiring people, expanding, doing new products and all that. And I think there'll be some of that to some extent. Uh, it will be an incentive. Whenever you raise the after-tax costs or, or the after-tax return on an investment, you're going to get more of it. So you yeah. raise the after-tax you know, return by lowering the taxes on these things. On those, as well as for corporations, if they're going to have a 21% rate instead of 35%, even if the effective rate was lower than 35, mm-hmm. they're going to invest more in things they're going to get them a higher return. And uh, we got the repatriation, not a quite as favorable terms as was hoped, 15.5% for cash sitting overseas, 8% for assets. So I guess what most of them will do is buy assets and then uh, repatriate the after-tax asset. Exactly. <laughs> right? So what it creates what incentives assets? to do strange things. But I mean, yeah. again, getting this money back into the U.S. instead of having it be stuck overseas, I've heard estimates of running between 2 and $4 trillion would be a good thing. But the big mm-hmm. question overall, Kerry, is what are companies going to do with this extra profitability they're going to have from the repatriation and from the 21% capital uh, uh, you know, rate? They, basically, there's three things the companies can do. They can invest it back in the business, plants and equipment, hire people, R&D, you know, make the business grow. They can buy back stock and they can raise dividends and executive compensation. So some companies will do some, some will do others. But I think a lot of companies, if they don't see a major place to invest the money because they don't going to get a good return on it or their markets are already saturated, whatever it may be, they're going to buy back stock and raise dividends, which is why the stock market has done so well, because they're anticipating shrinking capital bases and higher dividends and putting a higher price earnings ratio on that. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it's going to result in more investment. And look, if nothing else, formations of new businesses, of small businesses have been on the skids throughout right. the entire Obama administration and the last couple of years of the Bush administration. That's going to turn this around for sure. We're going to see new business formations skyrocket. And look, if I'm a lawyer getting paid and working in Manhattan, getting paid two fifty to 300000 married, uh, total family income of well 315 it is it is it uh it pays for me to become a freelance attorney start my own firm and then just rent myself out to the old firm right. and I'm an LLC it's a pass through because up to 315,000 of joint income nothing none of the limitations apply to the pass throughs correct I have that so right people will do those kind of games but that t- could offset 
the, in, the, in the case of New York City person, what they may, you know, deductions they're not going to get for state and local prop, uh, income taxes and any property taxes they pay. So this, the whole jumble is going to be incredible. How are people going to try to figure these things out and, and do better for them? Oh. I really hope it helps the economy. I think it will, to some extent, create more economic growth. I think it's been oversold as to how much economic growth it's going to create. I do not think it's going to so-called pay for itself. I mean, I think revenues will go up, but the the, the benefits are going up. I mean, the expenses are going up, even right. it's not related to the tax bill, like 10,000 people a day turn 65 and more right, people yeah. are getting on Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. So just the demographic boom is, is what is a 75 million baby boom or something like that. That's kind of an inexorable gain in, in expenses for the government. That's where they spend the money is the entitlements. So That's I think the deficit is going to keep going up. Yeah, well, there's no serious effort underway to try to contain the deficit and to reduce spending. Although, hey, you got to give Trump credit. He got rid of 1,575 regulations this year. And all he's got to do is get rid of another hundred thousand, and we'll have a, we'll have a booming economy psychologically. Okay. It has helped. There's it's no question. Of getting rid of regulations. It has helped definitely, and business confidence and consumer confidence is at an all-time high. And people are willing to take risks and start new businesses and invest and all that. That's been very very positive. There's no question about it. Uh, but again, whether it's going to be enough. Uh, they're talking about 1.5 trillion increase in the deficit over 10 years. I think it'll be more than that when you get down to it. Between the yeah. rising expenses for entitlements and defense, while well, we're, we're adding a lot in, in defense, and the other thing that's going to happen is interest rates are going to be rising. I mean, the Fed raised rates three yeah. times this year. They're talking about raising it three times more in 2018. That yeah. adds money, uh, expense to the the treasury, which pays interest. Right now, they've been paying zero for a long time on treasury bills. You get that up to one percent instead of zero. That's a big dollar amount right there. So the deficit is going to keep going up. Yeah, I think that's inevitable for sure. And so I want to talk to you about Fragrance X. If you're looking for a great gift for this Christmas, FragranceX.com is the place to go. It's really an amazing website. You can save on Dolce and Gabbana, Burberry, Calvin Klein, Hugo Boss, and hundreds of more different fragrances. And look, they're all authentic they're all real. There's no counterfeit here. You get free shipping. You'll save up to 80% off brand name perfumes. And the best part of all, if you use the code LUTZ20, that's L-U-T-Z 20, the number two zero, you will save an additional 20% off on your purchase. The perfect gift for the holidays for him and for her. They've got millions of happy customers. FragrantX.com is the best place to go to get the best deals on all of your favorite fragrances. So anyways, when you look at all this, you know, for the big corporations, their effective tax rate is 13%. Uh, that's the latest number that I, I read about it, Jordan. So for an Apple, other than the repatriation repatriation aspects of it, which I don't believe are as big as they say, because Apple doesn't have the money in Europe or in Asian banks. They open up an account in Citibank called Apple Ireland, and that's right. where the money's deposited. So right. It's been repatriated already. The only thing is they've got a liability on their books for deferred taxes, and you know, they want to get rid of that. Is 15.5% tax rate enough to bring that money back? If they need it, if they don't need it, they won't. Yeah. Um, I, so a company like Apple or other companies in industrial areas, I think one area that is going to help them is immediate expensing of capital improvements and capital expenditures of various mm -hmm. types. I mean, yeah. something like Apple or building buildings or Caterpillar or something like that, that's going to help them. And that oh. is going to be a spur to capital expenditures, which we've been very, very low for a long time. Hey, so let's talk about that because you get to write off immediate CapEx expense, 100% as it's made that year for at least right. the next five years. That's something that the government is clearly underestimating the value of. And whether it really helps the economy in the long run or not is another issue because it probably could lead to malinvestment. Uh, just today, it said in the uh, journal, I think it was, Southwest Airlines, now that the tax bill is going to go through, is going to upgrade their fleet. They've got yes. 700 planes. They're going to go into replacement cycle and ex route expansion because now it's like a dollar for dollar reduction in their taxes. So it makes right. a lot more sense. And I assume that on your, your reports to shareholders, 
you're you're going to actually s- depreciate the airplane over 10 or 12 years. So your expenses on your books for the shareholders are showing a tremendous profit while your cost of taxes is going way, way down, even if it wipes out your net income for tax purposes to overinvest in your physical plant, right? It helps cash flow a lot yeah. to be able to get that. So that's going to be, I mean, that's a good example of improving capital expenditures, which of course helps Southwest Airlines with a more efficient fleet, but it also helps Boeing and the, and the people building the plant, the planes as well. So it has a kind of ripple effect, which is going to be very, very positive. That's that's kind of one of the parts of this tax bill that people are not really paying enough attention to, yeah. that I think could have a major positive impact. And major negative impact upon tax receipts because look at the end of the year if i can go buy a new ford f-150 you know tricked out for sixty-five thousand bucks and i can finance it and then i can simply just write it off my taxes deduct it you know from profitability again i'm paying it back over five years but i'm getting that tax jolt instantaneously cash flow positive again i mean all of this it's just going to have unintended consequences. We're going to have this CapEx boom that really might not be that good because the boom can quickly turn into a bubble uh, faster than anybody thinks. It could, know? but I, we've needed it. We haven't had enough capital expenditures for the last few years, so maybe we're going the other direction. But hey, there's or, a lot of old yeah. equipment and uh, particularly infrastructure of various types. If this could be a spur to fix up the, the roads and the bridges and all the things we know that are falling apart left and right uh, and new capital expenditures, that would be a good thing. So but, it, it's going to be, a, certainly the stock market is thinking this is a very positive thing because the, the, it's been on a roll all year and that's just our anticipation of what's happening. Now that it's actually happened, uh, actually having it roll out in the real world will be a different experience than just anticipating it all the time. Yeah, well, don't you find it fascinating? What should be a re- relatively simple thing the congress turns into the this just mind numbing exercise <laughs> that uh, that you really need to have an iq of uh, einstein <laughs> That's really what Congress does. <laughs> come to terms with it, to wrap your arms around it. And they don't even know what they've done. No. You know, this isn't even a case where you have to pass it to see what's in it. This is a case where you have to pass it, wait three years, and then you'll figure out what was in it. And by then it'll be too late. Right. Yeah. And I mean, the part of it that upsets people is that the, the business tax cuts are permanent, but the individual ones uh, expire at the end of 2025. So, and even before you get there, they start phasing out as well. Yeah. So the individuals may get a little bit of break up front, but over time, those breaks can disappear, but companies are going to have a, a runway to do this for, for a long time. Again, I hope that the companies invest that money, those extra profits back into their people. I think it's a little oversold. The Republicans have been talking about the average working getting a $4,000 a year w- rate, w- wage increase. I just don't think it works that way. I don't think companies get a tax break and they say, oh, well, let's hand it out to the workers in a big wage increase. I just don't think it works. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, obviously there's going to be buybacks and mergers, M&A activity for sure. Right. But certain, com- look, the big companies are not the ones that are growing. The It's the smaller and medium sized companies that are really growing, Jordan. So That's anything right. you do to encourage entrepreneurship, which had been on the decline in the U.S. for the better part of a decade, has to be a net positive. So, uh, hey, well, once you're talking about things going up, bubbles and all other great things, um, did you did I hear a rumor that you sold your house and put it all into cryptocurrencies? Yes, yes. I remember I got an additional mortgage to, uh, to the, the maximum the bank would let me, and I put it all into to Bitcoin. Yes, yeah. people are doing these things. I think. Yeah. This is the greatest craze in human history. I think this is bigger than the tulip bulbs, Kerry. This really is. I mean, the, the Bitcoin alone, never mind the other cryptocurrencies, started the year at roughly a thousand, and now, depending on the day, it's seventeen thousand, eighteen thousand, nineteen thousand. You know, it's up like nineteen hundred percent. Uh, this year and people are doing all kinds of wild and crazy strange things to get in on this right without having any clue what they're doing whatsoever it's kind of the ultimate definition of a bubble i guess you might say yeah well they're actually uh, if they're not taking out mortgages they're actually taking out advances on their credit cards Uh, could you imagine borrowing like twenty thousand dollars on your card and buying two bitcoins with it that's true can you imagine if these people's uh, spouses knew what they were doing? <laughs> what, yeah, well, it worked well this year, and so it creates a following. And so uh, the exchanges, like uh, Coinbase and Bittrex, the two examples, have just been overwhelmed with customers. I hear that Coinbase is the most searched term on Google yeah, of anything amazing. right now. Wow. And people 
set up these accounts. If you want to get, I'll give you a specific stock to play this actually, yeah. which is GBTC, mm -hmm. which is the, the Bitcoin investment trusts traded on NASDAQ. So that's a kind of a pure way for people to play it without having to set up an account and do all these coins and tokens and things like that. Um, very volatile, but I think in the long run, I, I don't do not think cryptocurrency is going away. They play a role no. um, in um, transactions. Uh, McDonald's says they're going to start taking Bitcoin in 2018. Um, you're seeing people buying homes in Bitcoin, all kinds of international transactions. It's under the underlying technology is what's called the blockchain, yes. which is a secure way of transferring information from one place to another. It's not only currencies, all kinds of things. And that is a very secure thing that people want to be using to making transfers. So, and it's it's big in the US, but it's even bigger in Asia. I mean, they are just crazy over this in China and Korea and Japan. Japan and especially. Japan is 40%. 40% of the trading's coming from Japan, if you can believe it. <laughs> yeah, they have Madness. negative interest rates, you know, and they've got not much growth. So this is much more exciting for them. Um, so it's a worldwide event. And there are other currencies. The two other big ones are Ethereum and Litecoin. Right. But there are other ones coming. Ripple is the next one coming, but there's going to be others. And there's Gosh. a lot of fraudulent ones as well. Yeah, well, I call them kleptocurrencies. That's right. <laughs> you know, there's serious uh, kleptos running around and people are getting burned left and right. This reminds me not so much of tulip mania, but of the South Sea bubble, because that's where the term bubble came into existence. And fortunes would be made and lost daily by people selling stock shares just on the street, literally on the street, selling right. shares in what they called bubble companies, interestingly enough. And these are bubble currencies, even though they're not really currencies, let's face it. You know, it's they're not, not currencies, currency. but they are being used for some transactions. Um, so it's not a complete, it's not only a speculative mania. There are some actual uses uh, for these things, yeah. but mostly it's a speculative mania. But look, if you, you are holding something that's going up in value 50% a month, which it's done the past three months in a row, are you going to spend it on anything? Are you going to use it to buy something? No, because the purchasing power could go up another 50% next month. So if you bought them, you're hoarding them. And I don't know who's selling them now probably people taking intelligent people taking profits yes because right? i always say well you know the old wall street saw uh, you never you never go broke taking a profit or you never lose money taking a profit my advice is you're up 10 20 times or more sell half of it because half of infinity is better than zero right and, and you're riding on the house at that point. You've gotten your original capital exactly. back and more. And then if it goes down, it doesn't hurt you that much because at least you got your original principal out. So I would agree with that. Right. But this is going much higher. This is going to be the story yeah. of 2018, I think, uh, the whole cryptocurrency. Now, we've had recently futures have begun trading mm -hmm. on Bitcoin in both the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Chicago Board of Trade. That, that kind of legitimizes it to some extent and allows pension funds and hedge funds and banks to kind of play it in, both on the long and the short side. Well, let me... So there are going to be more signs like that of what I would call legitimization of Bitcoin. I think Ethereum may have a futures uh, contract on it as well. So this is going to be the story of 2018, how this all plays out. Hey, let me ask you a dumb question. If you're a futures trader and you see that Bitcoin could go up 10, 15% in a day, are you going to go to sleep at night with an open position? Probably not. I mean, and, and the margin is extremely high on these things. I think it's how like 45%, yeah. 45 margin, something like that. Normally it's 5%. Yes. It's huge, as the man <laughs> said. The, the spreads are like nothing we've ever seen, which is probably why they got into it. And the spreads have to be because the volatility, even if you're buying a spread, which is when you sell one contract short and buy another one long, it could be in different months, different terms, whatever. But simplifying it. Even if you're buying the spread, the volatility is like who is selling you the call contract? Who is not the call, the uh Who's selling you the futures contract? Right? Yeah. Who is going to go risk that? Somebody else who's got a spread, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, if you're yeah. on the, in effect short Bitcoin in a futures market and it goes way up, you could lose your shirt very quickly. You know? Yeah. So, you could so, be so. bankrupt in the morning because the, don't forget, <laughs> sure. the cryptocurrency markets trade 24 7. The futures right. markets trade according to Chicago hours. So, whatever that is, uh, what is it, 9 30 to 3 30 or 1 30? Something when's like it? that. But oh, yeah, the markets keep trading after that. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. This, is, this is madness here. And <laughs> it's not going to end well. It never does, but it'll be a lot of fun until it does end. So that's the key to bubbles. Enjoy yeah. the bubble. Enjoy the ride up on your bubble because uh, 
the ride down. And get your principal out. Get yeah. at least double your principal out, and then have fun riding on the house. Yes. Yeah, that's the only way I ever made money in stocks too was selling them after significant appreciation, not waiting. Like Bernard Baruch said, uh, I got rich letting the other guy make the last ten percent. Exactly. Right? And so, we've had this. We had the dot com yeah. bubble in 1999, 2000. We had the real estate bubble in, 19, in 2007, 2008. Now we're having the Bitcoin bubble. People never learn. They just always think this time will be, this time I'll get out in time. And usually they don't. Yeah. And, you know, it's all about like I'm writing an article, you'll see it shortly, uh, called the Bitcoin bubbles over. It's all about the dopamine and people need that hit of dopamine and it's better than gambling. Well, it is gambling, but better than <laughs> doing drugs or alcohol or whatever else you need to do to get the dopamine hit. You know, maybe it's not so bad with cryptos as long as you don't get crazed, go, go overboard. Which people will. This is yeah. still the beginning of this. This is mm -hmm. uh, some person said that this is the equivalent of email in 1994. And it yeah. just kind of coming out of its hobbyist phase. It's like, what is this thing with an at sign? You know, what? how, how do you send this yeah, thing? And, like, like, and I can and get, then it took over the world. And right. I could, I could get email immediately. This is amazing. <laughs> well, hey, well, you know, talking about Coinbase, Charles Schwab, do you know how long it took Charles Schwab to hit 10 million accounts? Probably quite a few years. I think 30 years. Do you know yes. how long it took uh, Coinbase to hit? Like a month or something? <laughs> no, 13 million accounts in the past year. 13 million. So more people have opened Coinbase and they're the, I don't want to disparage them in any way, but they're the most connected to the U.S. government. They're reporting everything to the government. So make sure yes. all your taxes are in order. Anyway, Jordan, we got to run. Uh, uh, what's the best place to find you and so uh, hear you? My show. website is moneyanswers.com. I get emails from you folks all the time. I'm always glad to help them on all aspects of personal finance at moneyanswers.com. All right. And hey, be part of the show. Send Jordan myself an email, KL at kerrylutz.com. Don't forget the Twitter feed. It's heating up at Kerry Lutz, the Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Jordan, hey, happy, healthy new year to you and yours. And we'll talk to you in 2018, where maybe the Bitcoin bubble will go to infinity. Very good. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Kerry. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Now it'll be de rigor. You know, you'll you'll just set it up automatically. And uh, but I think if you make less than three fifteen, I, I don't jointly three hundred fifteen thousand. I think the limitations don't apply. Do I have that right? That's right. That's right. So so it's going to be a big game. I mean, well, in theory, the purpose of this is to get small businesses growing, paying lower taxes, hiring people, expanding, doing new products, and all that. And I think there'll be some of that to some extent. Uh, it will be an incentive. Whenever you raise the after-tax costs or, or the after-tax return on an investment, you're going to get more of it. So you. You yeah. raise the after-tax you know, return by lowering the taxes on these things. On those, as well as for corporations, if they're going to have a 21% rate instead of 35%, even if the effective rate was lower than 35, mm -hmm. they're going to invest more in things that are going to get them a higher return. And uh, we got the repatriation, not a quite as favorable terms as was hoped, 15.5% for cash sitting overseas, 8% for assets. So I guess what most of them will do is buy assets and then uh, repatriate the after-tax asset. Exactly. <laughs> right? So what it creates what incentives assets? to do strange things. But I mean, yeah. again, getting this money back into the U.S. instead of having it be stuck overseas, I've heard estimates of running between 2 and $4 trillion would be a good thing. But the big mm -hmm. question overall, Kerry, is what are companies going to do with this extra profitability they're going to have from the repatriation and from the 21% capital uh, uh, you know, rate? They, basically, there's three things that companies can do. They can invest it back in the business, plants and equipment, hire people, R&D, you know, make the business grow. They can buy back stock and they can raise dividends and executive compensation. So some companies will do some, some will do others. But I think a lot of companies, if they don't see a major place to invest the money because they don't going to get a good return on it or their markets are already saturated, whatever it may be, they're going to buy back stock and raise dividends, which is why the stock market has done so well, because they're anticipating shrinking capital bases and higher dividends and putting a higher price earnings ratio on that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's going to result in more investment and look do so and particularly in the high tax states fewer people it's going to really reduce the the values 
of homes in uh, high tax states and particularly where the property taxes are, are higher and the, the values of the homes are higher. Yes. Yeah. But for Joe Sixpack making up to like a hundred thousand a year tax, the tax uh, bill is a net positive. Usually uh, the standard deduction is doubling from 12,000 to 24,000 for a family. Uh, 85 to 90% of Americans will no longer need to itemize at all, uh, which is a good thing. It means it simplifies things. Uh, it also means that they don't care anymore about mortgage deductions, charitable contributions, medical expenses, student loan interests, uh, all kinds of things they've been worried about in the past uh, that well, they will not have to think about in the, past, in the future, uh, which in some ways is a good thing. I mean, it's basically the tax code should be kind of somewhat neutral and not trying to do social engineering. Um, so that's going to be a big change for a lot of people. And, and those people who are worried about, it, for example, charities are worried that people will not contribute as much if they don't get a tax deduction. So it's going to change behavior all over the place. Oh, yeah unintended consequences and like you're i don't know if they excluded law firms and accountants from the pass-throughs i but, think they did but, i think that because that's going to be a big game yeah. is what is a pass-through uh a subchapter oh. s llc you can't like be an athlete uh you know and then create your own you know jim jones uh, llc is a right. good, things like that but this is what they call the guardrails but mm -hmm. there's a lot of very smart accountants well uh, who are going to try to figure out how to get around these things and create llc's and subject oh, yeah. all over the place well the obvious thing is if you have a law firm the law firm itself won't be a pass-through but you can create a practice management corporation to run that which a lot of uh, medical practices already use and i think the practice management company isn't going to be excluded from the uh from those guardrails I think it's right. within the guardrails. So That's every right. big law firm is going to have a practice management, big medical practices. They often already do. That's what enables them to go across state lines and build up the, uh, the practice by acquiring other practices. But FSN Radio, it's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's December 20th, 2017. 11 more days left till tax reform kicks in. Hey, as always, email us, kl at kerrylutz.com, kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz. We answer all, be part of the show. So tax reform is kicking in. For some, it's a mixed bag. For others, it's a major score. And for still others, it's, eh, well, which is it going to be? Well, Jordan Goodman's with us now. And to opine on it, Jordan, welcome back. Great to be with you and Kerry. It is a mixed bag and, and there's going to be big winners and big losers based on this tax reform. And it's intentional. I mean, they really were trying to stick it to the high tax states with big property taxes and they're going to get it. So New York, New Jersey, California, uh, Connect Michigan, Connecticut. You know, places with big taxes are going to get hit. Minnesota. Minnesota has a 9.85% state tax rate on the highest earners. Uh, you've got many states. Actually, a state like Illinois is not as bad as a state like New York, where it goes up to like 9% on the if you're making over a million. And then if you're in New York City, God forbid, you get another five and a half percent tacked onto there. But look, yeah, sure. Congress wanted to stick it to the uh, blue state people. But the other thing is why if I live in Florida and I don't have a state income tax, why should I subsidize your state income tax? High state just income you have, tax. Just because you have been for many years. There's no yeah. reason for it, but it's just been the custom and people have made economic decisions based on the existing tax code, which is you get a deduction for state income taxes and for property taxes as much as they are. That's now going to be limited mm -hmm. to $10,000. The two combined property tax and state income tax maximum right. 10,000, uh, which is going to mean that people are going to pay a lot more in taxes because they're going to lose both those deductions. And I think on the margin, some people will move from high tax states like New York, California to low tax states like Florida and California and, and the Texas, uh, because uh, some people just don't want to pay those taxes. I mean, the idea of the overall picture was you had to raise taxes from something to cut taxes on other places like the mm. corporate rate going down and like the pass through, which is a big tax cut for uh, LLCs and subchapter S corporations that are now going to have a much lower rate than they did before paying at personal income rates. So somebody's got to pay for somebody else getting big benefits here. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, I don't know how many people are really going to move, but I think a lot of you out there, it pays to become a renter. 
And let me give you a for instance here on a house that's worth one hundred twenty thousand dollars in no special place in Florida. And that's a low priced home, middle class, working class. Generally, your rent is going to be somewhere around one percent of the value of that home per month. In other words, twelve hundred dollars. However, if you're renting a six or seven hundred thousand dollar home, your rental is going to be somewhere around half a percent per month. So on higher end homes, you pay, you actually get a discount off of value of that home. Now we might very well see that trend reverse here, Jordan, and those higher end homes could go up in value or be more sought after as rental properties than they are currently. I agree with you because I think a lot of people are not going to want to own their own homes or at least on the margin. I think people will make a decision uh, if there's a place with high property taxes, um, never mind state income taxes. If only $10,000 is deductible, uh, maybe it's going to make more sense to run that as a business and and rent it out. I I agree with you. It's going to change the real estate market in a major, major way. You've already seen that mortgage applications recently were down about 5% because people are unsure going into this whether they want to buy a home or not. So this is a major change change in kind of the American dream. Everybody wants to own a home. I think a lot fewer people will. If nothing else, formations of new businesses, of small businesses have been on the skids throughout the entire Obama administration and the last couple of years of the Bush administration. That's going to turn this around for sure. We're going to see new business formations skyrocket. And look, if I'm a lawyer getting paid and working in Manhattan, getting paid 250 to 300,000 married, uh, total family income of well 315 it is it is it uh it pays for me to become a freelance attorney start my own firm and then just rent myself out to the old firm right. and I'm an LLC it's a pass through because up to 315,000 of joint income nothing none of the limitations apply to the pass throughs correct have that so right people will do those kind of games but that t- could offset the, in, the, in the case of New York City person, what they may, you know, deductions they're not going to get for state and local prop, uh, income taxes and any property taxes they pay. So this, the whole jumble is going to be incredible. How are people going to try to figure these things out and, and do better for them? Huh. I really hope it helps the economy. I think it will, to some extent, create more economic growth. I think it's been oversold as to how much economic growth it's going to create. I do not think it's going to so-called pay for itself. I mean, I think revenues will go up, but the, the, the benefit are going up. I mean, the expenses are going up, even right. it's not related to the tax bill, like 10,000 people a day turn 65 and more I people know. are getting like Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. So just the demographic boom is, is what is a 75 million baby boom or something like that. That's kind of an inexorable gain in, in expenses for the government. That's where they spend the money is the entitlements. So That's I think the deficit's going to keep going up. Yeah, well, there's no serious effort underway to try to contain the deficit and to reduce spending. Although, hey, you got to give Trump credit. He got rid of 1,575 regulations this year, and all he's got to do is get rid of another 100,000 and we'll have a, <laughs> we will have a booming economy psychologically. Look, it has it, helped. There's no question of getting rid of regulations. It has helped definitely. And business 